I'd like to introduce you today to the force of nature that is Richard Charkin, who is a former president of the IPA, the International Publishers Association, and the UK Publishers Association, and for 11 years was executive director of Bloomsbury Publishing PLC. And he's held many senior posts at major publishing houses, including Macmillan, Oxford University Press, Current Science Group, and Reed Elsevier. There are many others. Um, he's recently founded his own business, Mensch Publishing, and his biography, My Back Pages, an undeniably personal history of publishing, 1972 to 2022, has just been published by Marble Hill Publishers. So first of all, welcome to the show, Richard. It's terrific to have you here. Well, it's lovely to be here. Lovely to see you, Alison. We worked together many years ago. Well, not that many years ago, but anyway. It, it feels like yesterday, doesn't it? It is actually quite right. quite a number of years ago now, but yes. Um, and, what, what, and you may notice I've, I'm wearing a Macmillan shirt. One of, one of my great challenges in, in, in my post-70-year-old life is to use up all previous promotional T-shirts. And this is I did. You know, I have. I worked for Macmillan for fourteen years. I never got a promotional T-shirt, so I'm starting to wonder. You know, I wasn't in the right circles, and that that is honestly, I think that's the story of our relationship. Is while you were <laughs> leading these companies, I was sort of you know being a minion down down below, but uh, bumping yeah. into you in the canteen every now and again and uh, at book yeah. fairs and so on. So yes, both of us worked. I think concurrently at Oxford University Press and overlapped at Macmillan, and yeah, yeah, lots and lots of, of doing. But that's publishing for you, isn't it? It is. It is. One of, one of the things about this book I've written, which we'll get into, but, but just a sort of observation, is that when I set off, I decided I didn't want to write anything horrid about a living person. Which um, must have been quite tempting, let's face it. Well, there were some temptations, but when I got to the end... I realised I didn't really want to hmm. be horrid because actually it's a very welcoming industry and nearly everyone is a friend. There are one or two exceptions, but but really really only one or two. And uh, overall, it's a very decent industry. I think that's really true. I think it's one of the reasons that people stay there despite the terrible salaries. And you know, there are many, many reasons to do other things yeah. in life. Yeah. And... There is something magical about being involved in producing books and the people who do it, as you say, on the whole, tend to be really interesting, creative, good people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm sure that's true in other industries, but, but anyway, this is the industry I know and you know, and certainly it applies here. And that industry, I mean, reading your book, and I, obviously I, I remember so many of the, you know, I was early in the stages of digital publishing and so on. So, so much of this was very familiar to me. It's very interesting to hear your perspective on it. Of course, you can't condense the book in like 15 seconds. But what do you think, as you did that work of looking back on the industry, what would you think were the, the big changes that you noticed and articulated over that career, of your, extraordinary career of yours? Um, okay, big changes. Uh, women. Mm. By far the biggest change in, socially and in the industry has been women. When I started, there were very, very few women in senior positions. And now, um, I don't know what the percentages are, but extraordinarily high um, uh, number of women in, in, and making good decisions and doing it and being publishers and being whatever they want to be. So that, that I would say, is the single biggest change and it's really interesting I remember and I remember this at Oxford University Press as well um although of course by the time I was there in the 90s there were quite a lot of women and Kim Scott Walwyn had had really pioneered uh, and, and you know, nobody could ever say that, that women couldn't couldn't do commissioning after after she had uh, led the humanities yeah. list at Oxford but there was um, a, a little cartoon somebody had up outside their door that said a, a strong hierarchy needs a solid foundation of women at the bottom and it did feel a bit like that <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. Um, that's um, I'm looking here. Yeah. So in the book, there's that picture. Yes, it's very it was striking. The board of Oxford University Press when I joined. And you could it, describe it for those listening rather than watching. Um, okay. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven white men of an age. Uh, aged from 50 to 65 
Um, and yeah, they were the people running the business. And they were well off blokes, mostly graduated from Oxbridge. Let's be. Well, I don't know whether they were well off. I, I, I don't think they made lots of money, <laughs> but they were certainly from privileged backgrounds. Yes. So I think all bar one went to a private school. Um, and I think probably all of them went to Oxbridge. Mm. Um, and it very much was a gentleman's occupation, wasn't it? With, with the emphasis on, on the gentleman and the, and the man. So what do you yes. think was the driver behind the change? Was it a societal thing generally, or was it something specific about publishing? Well, clearly a societal element in that. Uh, but I think in publishing, um, well, unlike coal mining, it was quite feasible for a woman to lead the business. It's quite hard to be the lead coal miner in a downer mine. I mean, that would be problematic. Uh, also, that we're in an industry where um, the raw materials, in other words, authors, are frequently women. <laughs> and, um, and indeed, the buyers, the market, is pretty female. So it's not surprising that uh, once we got over the hang-up that only men could run things, that women emerged and flourished and um, basically controlled most of the businesses now. So um, I, I think it's partly partly societal, partly partly the industry itself. So, yeah, so you're right. It, it's it's a mix, isn't it, of, of the two things? But it's it's so interesting that how that um, so many of the, the the leaders in the publishing world today are women, and, and it's it's great to see. Um, we're still, I think, working on the other aspects of diversity, <laughs> but we're getting there, and at least it's being sort of measured now, isn't it? Um, another element of, of the change in the industry over those 50 years that you speak about in the book a lot is digitization and you really were there back right in the early years of, of the oxford english dictionary being digitized and so on weren't you just tell us a little bit about that well actually it predates that um there was a meeting at the publishers association to set up um a, a new company which would represent every publisher's information in this it was called publishers database limited we were all going to pour our stuff into this thing and sell it and uh that never happened so and i was on that and i voted against it and it didn't happen and then the next one was um oup frequently in its history i don't think they'd mind my saying this um suffer from a lack of money uh, it's it's not so much nowadays. They seem to have got their act together, but certainly in my time, they they frequently didn't have any money, and so part of my job was to try to find money, and out of nowhere, part of publishing job is to find money out of nowhere, and I managed to strike a deal with an American electronic publisher called Dictronics who paid us $600,000 to uh, create floppy disk versions of three of our reference books. And, um, and we banked the money. It was, uh, it was a joy. We didn't have to do anything. Um, so that, that was my first introduction to digital publishing. Um, there's cash here. There's cash here. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that, and uh, then I was put in charge of uh, all the dictionaries at Oxford, including the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary. And it was very clear that the future of the OED was mo more likely to be in digital form. Indeed, in print form, it, the f original OED was going to run out of copyright. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Because it was, um, it was nice. So you needed to do another edition. And at the time, copyright ran at 50 years. So it's 19... Yeah, it's been 75 now, so, isn't it? That's yeah, so, so it's part of my... Um... And there was the fact that it was all stored in a in an unfireproof house on slips of paper. That was another well, issue. Well, and, and on bits of hot metal plates, yeah. which I have one somewhere, which I could show you, um, oh, which wow. uh, were being boiled down... I, f I found some in a skip around the back of the business. They were throwing them in a skip to melt them and sell sell the copper or lead or whatever it was. 
So, um, for various reasons, it seemed appropriate <laughs> um, that we did this thing. There was a certain pushback from uh, one of the professors of English who wanted us to start from scratch rather than take the original and add the new stuff because some of the original stuff was not quite as good as it might have been. And the argument against that was, well, in which case, we'll never do it. Quite. But rather uh, like the French, the Trésor de la Langue Française, which has never been finished. Um, and, and one of the things about publishing is good enough is good enough. Um, mm. And we tried to make... Done is better than perfect, that's our mantra. Yeah, yeah. and we didn't... We did a bloody good job, actually, of making it as good as it could be. Um, so it involved... Um, we had to read uh, the scanning technology was not up to snuff at the time, mm -hmm. so we had to retypeset all. I think at the time it was like twenty odd volumes, um, with lots of funny typefaces and fonts and uh, mm, special, characters. special characters and all that sort of thing. Um, we did it twice, and did a purge, merge and purge. Uh, that cost a lot of money. Um, and then we had to write parsing software to take the new stuff and find the old and bring the two together. Um, and and then we had to have a team of lexicographers overseeing it and da, 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 and software writers. It was a whole new world to, to everyone. Absolutely. I mean, it's phenomenal. It really is one of the landmark digitization projects uh, in the world, it isn't was. it? It and, was. And, 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 but some things didn't change. Um, like proofreading. Mm. Everything had to be proofread. Well, we discovered, actually, if you merge and purge, you only need one round of proofs, not two. Now, that doesn't sound a lot. It was, about, If I remember rightly, the difference was £300,000. So it, it was quite a lot. And then things like we had an um, advisory council. Um, we didn't quite know why. Um, <laughs> it lends some luster, doesn't it? Luster and... I, I remembered so well. We asked everyone. We asked said yes, and that included Philip Larkin, Umberto Eco, the the CEO president of IBM Worldwide, and I don't know who. But it was a very. We, I don't think we ever met, but it, it was just a typical publishing thing to give it the the. the um, and they were all thrilled to be involved, and they mm. sent them each tie in, in the colours. <laughs> There we are with the back with the merch. Yeah. <laughs> Except for, the, for, for there was one woman and we sent her we, a, a cravat or something like that in the colours. Anyway, that's, um, and then we got it out on time. Uh, we started in 1982 and I think it was published in 1988 or 9, um, by which time I'd left OUP, um, but I was invited back to the party, of course. And can you see... I don't know whether you can. Behind me, there is a set of the OED. There's the OED. There's not many people have the full set on their bookshelves. I, very impressive. I was owed that. And I, I wish I'd pulled out this uh, thing. But anyway, yeah. Um, but what, what's fascinating, Sir, is that you, you now, so your career is not over. You, you know, you, in your yeah. subtitle, you say, you know, career to 2022, uh, which is a nice. 50-year finish point, but it's it's a lie, isn't it, Richard? Because here you are running Mensch. So you've been involved in some of the biggest projects done by some of the biggest publishing houses in the world. You've led most of them. And now here you are, a scrappy startup founder. What's that like? It's a nightmare. I'm... <laughs> it's, um, it's very well challenging in the interstices of the business. It's Tell us more. Well, it's not the big things. Like, do you publish something or do you not? Is I, Actually, I find a relatively simple thing. It's important, but it's simple. But finding a high-res photo of myself proves to be very, very difficult because I'm, I'm not very good at filing. <laughs> um, and, you know, the production process, I mean, there is only me. Um, yeah. Uh, I do the royalty statements myself, manually, because I'm the only one who knows where all the revenue is. And so I'm laughing because this this is sort of exactly how practical inspiration started. <laughs> right. Okay. So you got. Um, 
have, I have no staff. I have no one to turn to. Uh, I do remember meeting you. I think it was the Frankfurt Book Fair and you just set up and you, was, you sort of said, Alison, I've, I've got to sort my own ISBNs out. Yeah. <laughs> just just laughing. You were very sophisticated. This is my ISBN list. <laughs> very good. It's, for anybody not watching, it's, it's basically, it's, it's a printed sheet with lots of handwritten scrawling on it. <laughs> um, exactly. Uh, and I noticed that some of the scrawling is fading. I better... <laughs> Um, to your own digitization project yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah so it's but it's enormous fun and, and and the only thing i have to offer a, 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 but so for for starters authors are at the center of it um the only thing i have to offer the author because i i don't have a sophisticated marketing department or a social media thing or a super production thing or reps in far corners of the world um all i have is the relationship with the author uh and that's very pleasurable um not least because i only publish authors who want to be published by me and whom i want to publish so it, the, the, it's a much closer relationship than you can have. I have no budgets, so I don't have to publish anything. Um, I don't feel obliged to. In fact, I, I, I'm rather overcommitted rather than undercommitted. I've got too many books. Um, so I don't know what I do about that. But um, so, so I, you know, I suppose the thing is the author can ring the owner of the company. They don't get the sales director or the editor or the thing. They get the owner. Then they don't even get the managing director. They get the owner. It's a it's a big deal, and they can ring me any time, and they do. <laughs> I, I do work every day, uh, Christmas Day included, um, and uh, I respond. I mean, a few little things. I I pay royalties quarterly. I pay them the same day that I receive money from the distributors, I produce a royalty statement and send it. Um, I respond to all submissions, actually from authors or non or existing authors or, or non existing authors within 24 hours, actually normally within two hours. Um, did, did you sort of consciously set out to, to when you set up your own company and you had the freedom to run it exactly as you please were there sort of things that you thought this is where publishing is falling down and this is what I will do differently yeah. you know when you have kids and you're like I'm not going to do this I'm going to do this with my kids was it like that yes and part of the reason for setting it up but actually in conversation with people at Bloomsbury uh, was to see what lessons I would learn mm. and share them which I do um I mean I mean, when I say interstices, some of them very trivial. Like, for instance, most general book publishers still print prices on the books themselves. We have this conversation so many times. It's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. Not least, 60 to 70% of the books you print are bought in countries where sterling is not the currency. So they don't know what it means anyway. Um, it's absurd. It, it adds to the cost because if you want to increase the price, you have to take it out of the warehouse and stick it in the door. So it's things like that. Another thing is jackets for books. Why? Printing on printed paper kits is yeah. absolutely fine. Saves paper. Mm -hmm. Saves hassle. Um, this is the big sustainability issue with yeah. books as well, isn't it? So we're really rethinking the whole supply chain. Yeah. yeah. The price on books thing, by the way, just just to sort of come back on that a little bit. One of the reasons that people do keep prices on books is if we expect them to be sold in bookshops, because a punter going into a bookshop wants to know what the price of the book is. They won't take it until well, they find out, and that's what keeps stymieing I us. fundamentally disagree with you because. No, one, no one's ever bought a book because they thought it was good value. They bought a book because they wanted it. Now, yes, and I, I've I've put books back myself because there wasn't a price on it, and I couldn't be bothered to go and find it out, and I didn't want to go with a blank check to the to the checkout. Well, or the so, other way around. Everyone thinks books are expensive. You ask anyone, they're expensive. Oh, I know. I, 
looks, That's so they look at it, it says 25 quid, they put it back. They don't buy it. If it doesn't have a price, they don't know. They assume what it is. <laughs> they get to the till and um, the, it's too late. It's embarrassing to say it's too late. <laughs> So what we should do is price our books really high and not put the price on right. Okay, we'll try. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, I love that. And, I'm, I'm, and, and you know, look, with my own book, I'm pretty sure if I took this to a marketing department at Bloomsbury or Penguin Random House, they would say, um, well, it's 150 page, 160 pages. Or maximum paperback twelve ninety nine. Well, we've done it at twenty pounds, and not one person has complained, and it's selling pretty well because it, people want it. Books are so underpriced, aren't they? That that, that is a, sort of culturally they're undervalued. Yeah, so it's, those, it's a whole different conversation. Yeah, and, and indeed the twelve ninety nine, which is a load of nonsense. Why not thirteen pounds or fifteen pounds or twenty pounds? Ninety nine p. That, that was invented in the days of three farthings by Marx and sponsors. It was the argument that it was psychologically low is complete nonsense. It was to stop uh, uh, the cashiers putting the money in their pocket. I did not know yeah, that. They had to ring it up and give you the farthing back. So it was because so, the, the retailers didn't trust their staff. Wow. And then they had they couldn't say they don't trust their staff, so they say, oh, well, it's psychologically Psychological bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> so, mirroring, I'm trying to haul us back on track here. Uh, mir- mirroring that change from um, big publishing company to startup publishing company, you've gone from the person who made the decisions in the publishing process, or you know, who oversaw the management of it, to being an author. Now, weirdly, I started my career as an author and then went into publishing, but this is your first time around, right? How how was it? it? It was it's well it's been terrifically rewarding. The the it was a lot more work than I'd anticipated. Even though I had you have a new empathy for authors. No, I haven't. I definitely do. Um, <laughs> but I think the most um, uh, the most significant thing is concern: will people like it? Yes, the emotional the vulnerability of it. Absolutely. And I, I, I was really, really quite worried, um, and it's been okay. But, but I, I, but that because you know, you as a publisher, you worry. You want the books to be liked. You want the books to sell. All that, but it's not nearly as visceral yeah. as it is for the yeah. author. And so that. Oh, I hear you. Yeah, that that's been my big discovery, and 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 thus enhances my, I hope, my empathy for authors. Yes, it's it's a good discipline, I think, for a publisher to have been in that position. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you, of course, worked with Tom Campbell, didn't yes, you, as, yeah. as a sort of co co writer? Well, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it, it all came about very strangely because I was asked to write the book. Several or asked various people asked me at various times, why don't I sort of recall some of these stories? Um, and I said, no, who needs another book from another bloody self-satisfied smug publisher? And in any way, my brain's gone soggy. I can't remember most of the stories. And uh, it's very boring. And I don't have the time. And then actually my daughter suggested, Tom, Tom Campbell's, I've known him since he was very small. He's the son of a very good friend of mine called Bob Campbell, who used to run Blackwall Science Publishing. And we they, his kids and my kids grew up together. And my daughter, who knows Tom very well, suggested to Tom that he might be interested in doing. He's written a couple of novels. He, he writes well, and he and he said yes. So we went to the um, uh, cafe in Newington Green, and I just told a few stories. He made a few notes, uh, and then wrote them up. And I played around with it and. We did this like once a week for about six months, uh, two hours, sometimes in the mild May working men's club, sometimes in the cafe. And uh, there was a manuscript. And um, and before doing anything else, I asked Tom if he'd mind if I sent it out to be refereed because I, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't making a complete fool of myself. And uh, I think we went to about eight or nine p 
people who participated in one aspect or other of, of the book. And they all came back criticizing the bits they knew about, but saying how much they enjoyed the bits that they don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> and you figured, well, the readers won't know any of it, so it's fine. <laughs> And then one of them said, tell you what, I think it's so good, I'll publish it. And we'd not really... Yay, that was Francis. Yeah, we'd never thought about publishing. Well, we'd thought about it, but we had no really strong ideas. The, the one thing that I didn't want to do was to give it to a publisher who would... Well, first of all, they would say no. Most of the big publishers would say, we don't, we're don't. we not interested. It's not going to sell a million copies, And obviously. Um uh, but if they did say yes, they'd say, yes, well, the first slot is April 2025, and that will be for the UK. And, of course, the US will follow in a two months later, and Australia three months later. Oh, this is just nonsense. So the idea of doing it with a small publisher. <clears throat> and we were aiming for Frankfurt this year, October. And this, I think we only handed it over in March. Uh, wow. Um, and then I, I stupidly said, well, what, is it, it's not possible to do it for the London Book Fair, is it, in April? And Francis, the publisher, said, oh, let's see why not. Um, so we went for it. Um, Amazing. And it was very quick. And um, that's, how, that's, that's how it came about. And I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it, which is the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be great to put the back? Yes. <laughs> No, not ashamed of this oh, book. Actually, that's that's that's... Ringing endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, Richard, I'm going to ask you for your best tip. I normally ask authors for their best tip as authors. I'm going to be slightly off piste here, and I'm going to ask you, as a publisher and as somebody who has a real instinct for what works in a market, mm. what would you tell authors who are putting together their first business book particularly? Um I think, <clears throat> I, was, I was thinking about this question because it was in my mind when I set out, who was I writing this book for? Mm. And it, it is a business book. It, it, it's a book about a business. Um, and I realised there were like half a dozen potential purchasers, readers, uh, students on MA courses in publishing, new recruits in the, to the publishing industry, leaders of the industry, historians of the book, I mean, various. But I decided that you can't write for more than one audience. There may be more than one audience, but you have to decide which one you're going for. Um, and I, I decided, because it started with people on these courses, I, I sometimes do a talk to students uh, in publishing courses, and several of the lect proper lecturers, not me, would say, why don't you write it down? I thought, well, that's it. I'm writing this for students at publishing courses. And so the advice is, don't think of everyone who might buy it. Think of one. And, and it's a little like, you know, if you give a talk, one of the tricks is to look at one person. And imagine you're just having a conversation with them like we are doing now and I would say the same <clears throat> and if they do that to hit one audience absolutely fair and square the rest will follow one hopes yeah so that yeah I, it's such good advice yeah and I always rain authors back when they're like oh and it's the general reader no 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 <laughs> who, who is it really for and it's it, I always think of it like a sort of bullseye on a target you of course you, there's, there's lots more that you, you will hit but but who are you really That's aiming it for and as you say the side effect of that is you feel like you really know that person and you care about them presumably because that's why you're writing so it makes the tone warmer and more personal and more engaging exactly right? that yeah so terrific advice it, <laughs> rubbish <laughs> and if I were to ask you to, which I am of course so it's not hypothetical at all what's one book that you would think that anybody listening should read that you would like the opportunity to share with the world yeah. apart from your own uh, my own back pages what, what, what would you want everybody to read um, well nobody needs to read the book I'm going to recommend nobody needs to it's not the dromedary one is not it? the dromedary <laughs> <laughs> nobody needs to to read this book but i think everyone who does read it will be pleased 
to have read it. It's a book that came to me from an author called William Boyd, mm. who's a novelist, who sent me... In Brazzaville Beach. Yeah, uh, who sent me an email. I've known him forever, since my Oxford days. Um, sent me an email saying, terribly sorry to do this to you, Richard, but my best friend has written a memoir during lockdown. And would, I, would you mind reading it? Because I, William think it's the funniest book I've ever read. Wow. So I read it that afternoon and I, I rang Will back and said, well, look, I think if you send that round most of the British publishers, um, they will say no because uh, it's uh, written by a 72-year-old privileged old Etonian um, and it's a book about his business and his life, um, uh, but he's so privileged and so rich and so yuck, not right for the contemporary market that they will say no, and I'll probably say no, but I'd like to meet him. And we met that evening and I signed it up. And um, he is um, he set up a upmarket jewellery design business, designs very expensive jewellery for the rich and famous, and his book is all about every disaster he's managed to create by himself. And it's a business book because it's not about what to do, but it's really about what not to do. Uh, the, the author is called Theo Fennell. The title is I Fear for This Boy. Um, he was forced to leave Eton slightly earlier than anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> and his final report, this is from his housemaster, I fear for this boy, was all they could think to say about his career. <laughs> and, um, and indeed, it's proved to be, uh, and the back shows him with Vinnie Jones being thoroughly disreputable. Um, uh, it's a wonderfully funny book about... Oh, it sounds terrific. Uh, ...about business and how, how easy it is to go wrong. And um, as Will said, he thinks it's as good as Three Men in a Boat. It will be around with us for 50 years. And indeed, certainly the reviews and the sales have supported such a notion. So that's what I would recommend. I love it. I am so going to read that. Uh, it's, always, it's always nice. Misery loves company, doesn't it, in entrepreneurship? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, brilliant. Exactly. And Richard, if people want to find out more about you, more about your back pages, where should they go? Um, well, the... Uh, I don't know what to say. You can go to more or less any bookshop and or you can order it, um, and I would. Uh, apparently, I should just say this, that um, everyone who's written who I know, who've actually read the whole book, they've said, you know, you can read. We, I, I read it. It only took me two hours or three hours or something. In other words, it's not a big stretch. It's not like, like trying to read the OED, for instance, or... <laughs> <laughs> but at least the OED explains each word as it goes along, Richard. That's true, that's true. Um, and there is no index in this one. Um, but and I loved the reason for that. Uh, uh, what, uh, just give me the reason why there's no index. Oh, um, because people are most interested in whether they're in it and what I have to say about them. And if they find the index and they're not in it, they won't buy the book. If they find the index and they are in it, they'll, they'll look at the one sentence and say, ugh and not buy the book. So we we don't have an index. Also... So you have to buy the book. You have to buy the book. But also, I think in, this is another thing about what you learn. In the 21st century, most books... If I mean, one thing we did, we had a very detailed contents mm. at the beginning, so people can just glance through to see the bit they're interested in. And if you're really interested in the book, you can buy the e-book and you can do a... Uh, a search, uh, and there you go. Most people hardly yeah. ever actually use the index, whatever they may think. It's still a big thing for librarians for some reason, but yeah, yeah. you're dead right. And actually, even if you've got the print book, you can always search it up on Google Books, and exactly. then there you are. There's the hit, and you can find yeah. the page. Yeah. Exactly, if you're that interested. So, um, and, and of course, doing an index slows the production process that little bit because you can't do it till you've got the final page number. Oh, yeah. yes. oh, yeah. It's these little 
And when you do, when you've got a six-week turnaround, that matters, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, <laughs> where to buy it? Um, you can buy it from the publisher direct, Marble Hill Publishing, but you know it's available in ebook and and print. I wish it was available in audio book, but no one seems to want it. So, if, if anyone here <laughs> knows as someone who would like to do the, the audio book of it, I'm sure my publisher would do a deal. Um, and incidentally, we've had three requests for different language translations. Really, is isn't that remarkable? I probably won't yeah. come to anything, but the fact they ask for it is, is, uh, yeah. is something. Um, it, I mean, if, if you're interested in, as you say, the history of the book at all, it is such a you, you have really spanned such an extraordinary range of transformation within the industry and, and been at the epicenter of, of all of it. So, yeah, no, I found it absolutely fascinating. And I'm gutted to see my name wasn't in there. I'm actually quite relieved. But an awful lot of people that I have worked with over the years were, were in there. So it was quite nice to sort of yeah. get a sort of a, a different view on the industry from, from one that I had myself. So, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Good. Well, I hope you enjoy it. How long did it take you to read it? Oh, I don't know. I didn't time myself, but I was reading it on the train on the way down to London Book Fair, yeah. actually. So, well, yeah, hour, I finished it. Um, a bit more, yeah. Yeah, it, it was probably about three yeah. hours. Probably about yeah, three it's hours. not, it's not, if you if you think of the value of a book is is not just what you pay for it, um, but what it costs you to read it. And if, I don't know, minimum wage is £16 an hour, <laughs> so it only costs you £48 plus the cost of the book, um, that's not bad. And many books cost you a lot more than that to read. It's true. I've, I've often thought, you know, the value of the book is um, make it less yeah. <laughs> rather than more because my time is my most valuable asset. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so. brilliant. Right. I genuinely could talk to you all day, Richard, but I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, it's great to talk to you. My pleasure. My pleasure, Alison. Thank you.